Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about a tale of two stories that both center around a claim for land and a struggle against the federal government for that land. But my guest today argues that's where many of these similarities end in these two stories. In her book, Standoff, Jacqueline Keeler chronicles both the 2016 Standing Rock Sioux Tribe standoff against an oil pipeline in North Dakota and the Bundy family's takeover of Oregon's Mollier Wildlife Refuge in the same very year and how these two stories illuminate an American history around settler colonialism. Jacqueline Keeler is a Dine in Ihunktonon, Nakoda journalist, and the full name of her book is Standoff, Standing Rock, The Bundy Movement, and The American Story of Sacred Land. She joins us over Zoom. Jacqueline Keeler, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thanks for having me, Mitch. <laughs> now, you've covered both of these events as they were happening, both Standing Rock and, and the Bundy takeover. Um, you were covering these as, as they were happening. And I, I, I found it fascinating how you put these two stories in a historical context. And I, I want to really dive into that with you. But as you were covering these in real time, were, were you thinking about the, the connection to the sort of settler colonial, uh, settler colonial history? Yeah, when I was interviewing, uh, when I well, well, if you if you ever watched the uh, Burns Paiute Tribe's very first press conference after um, they gave uh, after the uh, after Alan Bunny and his followers um, took over the wildlife refuge, um, which is part of their homeland and actually part of their original reservation, uh, the Malheur Indian Reservation. Um, you know, the first thing they say at the press conference is that if they had done this, they would have been faced with guns and they would have been shot. I mean, and and so, uh, you know, you might hear that in first and think that they're exaggerating, you know, but um, but definitely, you know, the kind of um, the sort of way in which uh, the Bundys and their followers use um, armed protest Part of it is based in a confidence that the um, that the uh, the government, which is you know their government, won't attack them, um, and or will will be um, very careful with handling them. And and this is you know they reference things, of course, like Ruby Ridge and Waco. And I, I think in a sense, I feel like that not only are they invoking their colonial privilege and white privilege, but they are also um, holding themselves hostage, daring. Um, the government to attack them, and uh, and so it's um, it's it's you know they're it's interesting because they are on one hand weaponized, but on the other hand they are really turning the gun on themselves. Do you mean um, I, I know that sounds strange, but that's just um, I feel like because of course they could never have enough weaponry to take on the U.S. military, uh, but um, but they um, but you know so it's 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 more of a yeah it's, it, it you get my meaning mm -hmm. <laughs> so. What, 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 what do you think, what's significant about both of these happening sort of near the same time, if, if not exactly at the same time? Yeah, I think that for me, 2016 was a year that began in January, of course, covering uh, the takeover at Malheur uh, with uh, white men in the snow with guns. And then ended the, I ended the year in December of 2016 at Standing Rock uh, and, um, uh, you know, with the celebrations at camp. Uh, when uh, Obama announced that they uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers was pulling the permit for the pipeline and to go under the river, the Missouri River, and so it's um, you know I think it was um, and at that one one of the things that really um, uh, sort of uh, put that decision uh, by the Obama administration was the uh, arrival of thousands of U.S. veterans and um, and and them putting their bodies on the line without any milit without any weaponry right they were unarmed and they were fulfilling their oath uh that they had given um uh, to protect um you know uh, um against domestic em enemies i guess and so they put themselves on the line and so that's it was just a very very interesting you know diff you know contrast right of course the heavily the heavily weaponized response i mean albeit it's supposed to be um sort of less than lethal methods, but there are many of the same methods used in Afghanistan and overseas, you know, um, and so it's um, uh, used against the, uh, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and, and water protectors standing for the water and, and invoking the treaty uh, that the U.S. has with the Great Sioux Nation, um, of which, you know, the county uh, that the sheriff who helped lead and participate in that military assault on the uh, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe 
um, you know, his county exists in violation of international law and in violation of that treaty uh, because that tr the treaty covers his county, right? And, and to the eastern side, eastern shore of the Missouri River, the crossing where the pipeline was uh, or is, it's um, still there and still, and, um, but it's, um, you know, uh, or it was built and now it's running, it's carrying oil. But, uh, but yeah, it's quite, um, it was a real contrast. And, and then, uh, and so, you know, then of course we were facing the Trump administration coming in right away in January of 2017, which seemed to me, you know, then watching how Trump was, you know, he, he immediately, you know, he pardoned the Hammonds who were the ranching family, the, the father son ranching, um, uh, duo that, um, that were convicted of arson and, um, and other things. And, and, uh, and then, um, um, resentenced because the judge did not invoke the um, under the law that, that they were um, sentenced uh, Republicans that instituted minimum sentencing requirements so they were supposed to go to prison for five years and the judge only sentenced them to a um, year or so and so they were being sent back which is what uh, precipitated the Bundys coming and taking over um, the uh, wildlife refuge in that county in Harney County in Oregon so it's um but to see you know the uh, uh what the trump administration did when they came in and you know of course immediately you know the some of the first uh, in january of 2017 some of the first uh, dis um, uh executive uh you know um letters or exact uh, that uh, that trump uh signed had to do with uh, these issues that native americans had uh you know uh, you know had achieved success um under the Obama administration, including Bears Ears, uh, the National Monument, which I wrote, my previous book is about Edge of Mourning, um, Native Voices Speak for the Bears Ears, and, uh, and you know, he reduced the size of the monument by 85%, and we're still not sure if that was legal or allowed under um, a particular, uh, you know, the Antiquities Act, uh, and, um, and then, uh, and then, and then, of course, uh, with the, he, he immediately announced that all the pipelines were back in business, and, and specifically the Dakota Access Pipeline, and also the um, Keystone XL Pipeline, which had, already, had been dead, you know, for quite a while. And um, so, uh, so this was, it was obvious that, that what these folks had done, the Bundys had done, really was an active form of political power, you know, that they were successful in that way. And so it's, um, it's quite, um, so, and, 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 you know, of course, um, so, and, and actually a former attorney of the of Clive and Bundy, the father of Ammon and Ryan Bundy, who took over the wildlife refuge. Uh, Clive, of course, was the uh, Nevada rancher who had that standoff for not paying his grazing fees in 2014 in, in Bunkerville, Nevada. And, um, and he, uh, his attorney, um, one of his attorneys um, from 1993, her name is um, uh, Karen Bell. Um, Karen Bud Fallon, and she's with the the Mountain States Legal thing. It's a, a right wing um, sort of a sagebrush rebellion, um, rural, uh, you know, uh, land rights, um, you know, anti public lands um, sort of legal um, movement. And she actually became the deputy solicitor of the Bureau of Land Management, the very agency that the Bundys um, were at odds with um, in Nevada and had the standoff with there. And, uh, and, you know, she, of course, had spent uh, decades um, basically uh, suing um, uh, the, uh, spuriously suing the BLM uh, for, um, uh, for BLM um, uh, employees for racketeering, uh, for enforcing um, federal law and, and regulations. So uh, now she was in charge of the legal, yeah, it's just, they have what they're doing, they have access to power. And, and in a way, so do, um, so do our people at Standing Rock. Um, um, of course, you know, a number of uh, really um, amazing politicians, uh, people who are now politicians, but were not at the time came to Standing Rock and were inspired to run to, to for office through participating in that, um, you know, including, of course, AOC. And, um, and Deb Holland, uh, who a Luna, Laguna Pueblo woman who um, ran for Congress, was one of the first two Native women to be elected to Congress, and, and now has been nominated and confirmed um, as the um, Interior Secretary, uh, and is now in charge of um, vast, uh, most of the land, in, um, a lot of the land, public land in the United States, and, and also the BLM and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. In understanding both what happened in North Dakota at Standing Rock and then also at the Mullier Wildlife Refuge in Oregon. What, what do you think is important to know about public land? 
Well, um, I think it's really important to know that, um, that, you know, um, that a lot of this public land, particularly that a lot of it is, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of it is actually indigenous land, right? And, uh, and, and, and certainly, you know, having it right now in legally in the public land sphere illegally with the federal government is, is a better space to have it than to have it, you know, privatized or have it handed to the states to sell off, right? Um, and um, which, which many states, including um, like Nevada, enter the union um, with a constitution that swore off the right to do that, I should say, which is something that the Bundys don't bring up. Um, but um, but when, I, when I look at my book, I, I'm really looking at um, sort of, I'm comparing the legal, um, the, the relationship to land that the Bundys have historically um, within their family history, going back to England, and, and, and what indigenous people have, um, particularly looking um, at my father's people, the Dakota and Lakota people, right? And so we have different relationships to land. And, and, and I really began examining with the Bundys their concepts of common land, because they keep talking about the commons, closing the commons. And they're speaking in terms of perhaps historical experiences in their own family of being removed from the commons in England and having those lands enclosed and forced to work in factories, right? That's really um, most of the people in England were not part of the ruling class. They weren't part of the class that Jane Austen writes about. They were, the vast majority were very poor and, and, and landless, right? For most of the last um, couple thousand years, right? And, um, or at least, at least uh, definitely since 1066 when, uh, when William the Conqueror took over. And in fact, to this day, uh, most of the land in England is still owned by the descendants of William the Conqueror and his friends. Right, they came in and they took over. They actually killed most of the noble nobility, uh, the ruling, the Anglo-Saxon ruling class, and um, and took their places. And uh, and it's interesting because when I was uh, you know researching the Bundys and I saw in their house they had the sign um, on their wall that said remember um, remember what the name Bundy means. And I was like, what does the name Bundy mean? And I looked it up and I saw that one of the definitions was bound servitude. Right. And, and then it's funny, the name James Bond also comes with this from your bond, giving your bond uh, to the Lord, uh, your oath in exchange for land. Right. And so you become tenant farmers. Right. But uh, allegedly um, under the Normans uh, rulers, um, this actually became this Anglo-Saxon arrangement became actual um, serfdom where the Bundys were, were part were, became basically property. And they were they so when the Lord inherited the land, he inherited the Bundys, right? And so so their relationship to the land historically, in, in, as encoded in their surname, is very different than what Indigenous people have because their relationship is moderated by um, by a feudal lord, right? And um, so it's a. Uh, for indigenous people, I, I, you know, I go through the definitions of, and, and I, and in the book, I assert that the U.S. is still a colony. Like this is not its homelands. These are the homelands of other nations. Right. So I, uh, I really look at, um, and so, so I look at their creation stories, their origin stories, which, which I view as, um, sort of a central sort of almost mechanism of, of identity and outcomes. Right. And which I call an algorithm. And, uh, and so uh, it, it sounds strange, but let me explain. Um, so with a colonist, the, the definition of a colonist is very clear. You know, you go to someone else's homelands, you occupy it, and then you send their wealth back to your ruling class, to your 1%. And, um, and, I, and so you can predict what a colony is going to do based on that you know, based on that. Um, and uh, whether it's, you know, build pipelines or, uh, you know, uh, dispossess native people, whatever, you can predict what they're going to do. Even if you have a president like Obama or, you know, sitting on, at the top of this machine, uh, which is already constructed to do these things. Um, I, 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 I kind of liken it to like, if you're, even if you're the person in the driving seat, what are you driving? What vehicle are you driving? Are you driving a sports car or are you driving a combine harvester? In which case it's going to just you know do what it it's built to do harvest the wheat and so if you're if you're at the top of a colonial machine it's inevitably going to do that you know and i think that we've seen that the structural issues um of the historical um sort of uh um 
things that we've inherited as a society, like the police, um, with the defund the police movement, that's a recognition that that maybe this this institution cannot be simply made better. That this institution represents and is built to do certain things, right? And uh, and I would say that's the same thing with the colonial government. Um, how much can we tinker with it? Because the structure creates the outcome, right? And um, and so. Uh, and also with individuals, this part of the structure of, of this particular colonial endeavor is white supremacy, right? Created to maintain the planter elite status uh, and, and power in Virginia in the 1600s, you know, against the a unified opposition of, um, of um, you know, more impoverished planters uh, and European indentured servants and, um, and people um, stolen from Africa and held in bondage. And, and so this sort of divide and conquer um, mechanism arose in Virginia at that time. And, uh, and so we've inherited all this and it creates outcomes as we saw in the Trump um, election, the election of Trump, where you have 90% of white men without, uh, um, who have high school diplomas voting for Trump. You know, that is not a individual problem that is a, a an issue of their uh, of their um, identity and, and a structural problem, right? Uh, so, uh, and then I compare that to indigenous people, and I found a definition. Um, and uh, in my um, in my, uh, my 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 grandmother's cousin, his, he was Vine Deloria Jr., and he wrote a book called um, "Custer Died for Your Sins," which and uh, which and and so I found a definition in one of his books. Uh, and of, an, of indigenous people. And he says a people with a capital P, because uh, we often call ourselves the people in our own languages, and um, that they have an origin story based in a meeting with a sacred being who is a manifestation of the land itself. And so in this meeting, we're given rules to live by and, by, uh, and, and we, and we uh, make this agreement. And it's so we don't have sort of carte blanche um, you know, uh, governance of lands, we have an agreement with the land and with the people who are already on the land, including, you know, in our case, the Buffalo Nation. Uh, you know, when the white buffalo woman, when we met the white buffalo woman, um, who was a manifestation of the Great Plains itself, you know, she came bearing a pipe, a chalupa, and that the, the stem of that pipe was made with the, um, with the leg bone of a buffalo. And, and this, and when we, so when we smoke it, we've made an agreement with the land and with the people who are already on it. And we share that. And uh, so we don't have dominion. So this is, um, it creates a very different outcome because it has a set of rules um, that act like sort of if then statements that create those outcomes, right? And so it's, um, so this is why indigenous um, communities, how they really differ fundamentally from colonial ones. Right. So when we look at like something like what Rick Santorum said last week, what we are seeing is not simply a um, deficit of knowledge. Right. We are actually looking at um, we're actually looking at a um, um, an outcome of, 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 of structure and history. And, and that we need to fully understand that. So what I'm trying to do in my book Standoff is to provide a framework that we can actually come we can actually utilize so we all share this land now um, to come to, um, I guess, uh, you know, <laughs> um, find ways to live together. We can't build a future using propaganda, um, which is what I found that a lot of the Revolutionary War actually is. And I go into in a completely different analysis of the Revolutionary War, its causes and, um, and its, uh, it, um, its outcomes. And, and I propose that the Revolutionary War was actually because of course I had to address the Revolutionary War because the Bundys reference it so much in their um, in their language and uh, and what I found was that uh, the Revolutionary War was really a war between elites um, and uh, I mean when I when you're researching the biographies of all these founding fathers you're always confronted with the phrase like one of the richest men in the colonies or one of the richest men in the world and um and and they all belong to land companies they all are investors in land companies and um and and you know even i, I you know i go back to Jamestown, which is you know i feel the um sort of the origin story of america which of course was um was a was a capitalistic uh, endeavor uh, it was a company town basically a corporation and that yeah. company was yes uh, the virginia um company of uh of adventures based in london and um and, and you know so we get into the whole mechanism of, of the very 
that you know this the corporate interest in America in America was it was the, that originally was originally corporate from the very beginning. And um, because when I, I give tell a story how um, how when I was interviewing uh, white farmers and ranchers in uh, South Dakota, Nebraska, they were completely shocked that the government, uh, in this case with the Keystone XL pipeline, um, had given governmental powers of uh, um, of eminent domain to a foreign company, Trans Canada. Right. And I was like, don't I mean, there's always been a tie between corporate interests and and the state. I mean, when you look at the history of some of these early um, colonies. And so, yeah, so that's so I, I really I feel like we need to have a better understanding of our own history and um, uh, to to be able to come to, to terms with what's happening now. And and the standoff we have in America that we have, uh, you know, between indigenous um, nations and the colonial state. And then also, um, you know, even in Congress, I mean, there's no way to get anything. It's very difficult to get anything passed. There's these are really hard lines. A couple of things there I want to follow up with you about one about where sort of the origins of, of the Bundys. And then the second, this, the, that native people still see this as a colonial state, First, let me begin with the Bundys, because it made me think about settler colonialism and who were the fo foot soldiers uh, in in this endeavor. And it, it, were, it was people like the Bundys. It was people who were sort of at the lower ends um, in England at the time. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so these these uh, the wealthy investors in land companies, right? Like like George Washington. And I, I go to the thing how George Washington started the first world war. Right. The French and Indian War is called by historians World War Zero. Yeah. Right. It's the first world war. And it was the impetus for it was really um, on this on this thirst for land by by the colonists. Right. By the English colonists. And uh, and one of the they uh, and it, it was a very expensive war. And it actually doubled the national debt of Britain and France. Right. And so to prevent another war. Um, you know, with the treaty uh, that, that, that ended the war, um, Britain agreed to control the colonists and keep them along, the, you know, keep them from crossing into Indian land and claiming Indian land. And, um, and so, uh, so, uh, so that's why um, when you read the uh, Declaration of Independence, a lot of what you're reading is all about this. This is what they're talking about is um, that, uh, you know, all this stuff against King George and the merciless Indian savages. This is all about King George passing the proclamation, issuing the proclamation line of 1763, which went along the Appalachian Mountains. Right. And that forbade Anglo uh, English colonists from going over the mountains. And so everything west of the Appalachians was Indian land. And King George III went about trying to make sure it stayed that way because he didn't want to have another war. He, you know, they could not afford it. And it was a war that only benefited the colonists. And, and they were making their home country pay for it. They, right? they wanted that land. Yes, they wanted that land. And particularly the wealthy guys wanted that land. Right. These are all, all the founding fathers and members of land companies. They're, and they want their investors. Right. And, and they'll parcel out that land to the little guy. Right, and uh, or sell it to them, and make a profit off of it, and um, and so it's um, but the uh, um, so the uh, so yeah, so this is why he was quartering soldiers in their homes to keep to to prevent them from going into Indian land. This is why they had taxation like the stamp tax to pay for a, a you know a war they started, because you know the uh, state the uh, the uh, the colonial legislator legislatures did not want to pass taxes to pay for to pay back for the money they spent uh, to, to do this war right so and King jo um, and George Washington who was a twenty year old he actually was uh, the one who started the war literally I'm not even joking you have to read the story in the book it's absolutely crazy and um, so and then he was also an investor in a, an Ohio land company right. And um, and so so you have these people who are like the Bundys, right? But really, what the motivating issue is 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 the quest for Indian land. You know, even if you're looking at Thomas Jefferson and his Jeffersonian democracy model of a human farmer, that is was revolutionary for its time because, as you know, in Europe, ordinary people did not own land. You know, the human farmer was a tenant farmer for the most part. You know, with the with the feudal lord, they still are. You know, and um, so, uh, but uh, but this mechanism of democracy relied on more and more Indian land, 
right? And um, and when he actually signed the Louisiana Purchase, he declared that this would this would provide a, a farms for a thousand years of Americans, right? And so the acquisition of Indian land has always been a central paradigm of of the of the U.S. of the United States, and this is the colonial the colonial state constantly needing more um, more um, you know places to consume. And, uh, and so it's um, very different from an indigenous nation, which is placed, um, which has a relationship to uh, the land and not the entire world, but a specific place on earth, right? So when we are talking about the Great Plains, this is our relationship, right? It's, and, and, and then when you're talking about my, my mother's people, the Diné people, you were talking about between the Dinata, between the four sacred mountains and the four sacred rivers. And, and so we share the outcomes of what happened in these places. We are not like transnational corporations that can enter a space, trash it, take the profits and leave, and then go to the next place. And this is really um, the difference in how these two um, different uh, origin stories uh, function and, uh, and create the structures that they do. And, and so this is why it's really not the same. Um, so when we look at the Bundys, uh, their story is very interesting, of course. Um, but um, but the Mormon Church as well, um, actually, uh, to seek members, um, actually sent. Um, I think even Brigham Young uh, went as a mission on a mission to uh, these very poor, impoverished folks live working in factories in Liverpool and Manchester, England. This was where they set, did their first missions, and we're talking about Dickensian conditions. You know where. Um, first of all, after um, the Enclosure Acts, which were acts that were for, went on for about 300 years, um, you know, before and during uh, the um, uh, Industrial Revolution in, in England, um, basically what they were doing was there used to be lands that were called the commons, and where, villi where villagers, commoners could have a little strip of land where they could grow a little bit of food, places where they could gather, you know, um, uh, you know, things to build, make baskets and, or to, you know, graze their cow or something, things that would just keep them alive, right? And basically what Parliament did after was they kept issuing these enclosure acts and basically, so you have to enclose your little strip of land, which was very expensive, right? To build a fence around a little strip that where you're planting a row of corn or something, you know, and, uh, and so that most of the commoners could not afford to do that. So what would happen is that the, the, the larger landlord, right, would then build the, would then enclose it and then take the commons, this ancient land that had been held in commons under Anglo-Saxon tradition, you know, back into, you know, um, you know, a, a, a people's history, right? And then actually bulldoze or, you know, kind of get rid of the homes of these villages, you, you know, and then, uh, and then once these people were homeless, then they criminalized their homelessness as vagrancy, right? And then, um, and, and this is where you get the concept of a waste people, a people who are waste, who are not actually human, right? And then once they're criminalized, then, you know, uh, send them to work houses as entire families working for not, not even enough to stay alive, right? In fact, when you read um, some of the um, uh, sort of the minutes and stuff from the meetings of these Mormon um, saints that were um, converts there in uh, uh, Manchester and Liverpool, they're actually dying um, of starvation. They can't even keep each other alive, right? And so to get them to come to America to push a cart all the way from across to uh, to Utah, you know, um, it was something that, that they, it was better than what they had, you know, and, um, and they didn't have the vote. I mean, uh, most of, uh, you know, with parliament, you know, there were um, a lot of issues in the 19th century that, um, that meant that many, even the entire community, uh, urban areas like Manchester didn't have any parliamentary representation because the, the parliament, the seats had been assigned in feudal times much earlier, and, and there were all these rotten boroughs. And so there was a lot of, you know, and, and commoners who didn't, did not have the vote at all, right? Um, there was all of those, um, the Petersburg riots, there were all these fights to try to, you know, the Chartists. It's a whole bunch of history there. And so they bring that history here. And, and I think that we don't recognize enough the extent to which the English Civil War played a role in, um, in in the ideas that fed the Revolutionary War and, and even in the United States. I mean, um, in Boston, um, a lot of the folks went back to fight in the uh, English Civil War, particularly like the entire Harvard class of that year went and fought for the parliamentary, parliamentary parliament. So, but yeah, there's, I, I think, um, you know, you have to realize that 
that Eng- English people are coming from a, a point of complete dispossession, right? I mean, the rulers aren't even really English, they're Norman, right? And so it's, um, so what they bring to the story. And so the, the Bundys came here in the 1600s originally as Quakers. And that was a very um, radical sect at the time, allowed women to preach, which was very new. Um, and also um, they were facing, um, they were being basically executed in the streets by the police and stuff for their stances on certain issues. And, uh, and um, of course, famously, William Penn was a Quaker and, and was able to provide a place for safe um, harbor for Quakers. And, um, and, then, and then coming to um, uh, the, Qua- the Bundys came to North Carolina, which was actually run by Quakers for a while until um, they um, refused to take oaths. So, and then they lost the right to vote because they were opposed to slavery, um, ironically, considering Clive and Bundy's later comments. And, and so uh, for the Bundys, they moved uh, with, to Indiana with a bunch of other Quakers, which they started Quaker communities after, of course, the, um, the Revolutionary War and the Ohio Valley was opened up. And then, of course, what they call the Northwest Territories. So they moved there and joined Quaker communities um, that were forming in Ohio, Indiana, and that area. But they, um, that's where they were converted to Mormonism in the late 19th century. And, um, and, but they didn't actually come to the Southwest until almost the 20th century. Like, um, so they were there quite late. And, um, and, uh, but uh, the, the Quaker community in Indiana kind of went down a dark road in the early 20th century where they became leaders of the Ku Klux Klan uh, in the 1920s. Yeah, it's a shocking. St- I mean, the history is very interesting. I think, um, I, um, yeah, but the taking of the land, do you know what I mean? That was the main goal of the Revolutionary War and was very yeah. successful. I mean, uh, the Iroquois Confederacy had stood for a thousand years in um, most of New York State, which is now New York State. And it was completely dispossessed, uh, you know. And of course, when you have all these people coming into um, a land, I look at the how that influenced the uh, the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening in the Burned Over region in what was the Iroquois Confederacy. I thought that um, a lot of these people coming in there, the 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 obvious existence of a civilization that was not in the Bible, must have sent them into a state of shock, you know. And I mean, we today probably don't appreciate enough the extent to which they really believe the Bible had all the history in the world. And mm-hmm. and to be confronted with evidence of a civilization that is not mentioned in the Bible had to be um, very disconcerting and even, you know, almost challenging. Uh, and, uh, and so you see this religious revival happen. And... Um, and the Bundy and Mormonism. and um, But I've later found other things about the origins of Mormonism, which I'm really shocked about, actually, and um, the connection to where I went to school, Dartmouth College. Um, it's um, pretty fascinating. I might, I didn't learn, read about that till later, but yeah. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Jacqueline Keeler. She is a Dine, a Hunktonwan, Dakota journalist, and she's the author of the book that we are in conversation about called Standoff, Standing Rock, The Bundy Movement, and the American story of sacred land. I just want to underline what you were saying about the American Revolution here, and especially the Declaration of Independence. And I'm taking this from your book, so this isn't from me. Uh, but you, you know, you point out most people are familiar with we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and you know, can go on and on life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. What is forgotten is the rest of the declaration, as you have quoted here, in which it says, quote, he has, meaning King George, he has excited domestic insurrections among us and have endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Uh, it's a part of the yeah. Declaration of Independence. I don't think most Americans uh, realize. Yeah, and most of the bullet points in that and the Declaration of Independence directly deal with uh, the proclamation line of 1763. And it, it speaks to the level of propaganda we're dealing with that people don't understand that framework, you know, that, that was what was going on, you know, that they were, they started a world war, they were being forced to pay for it, they couldn't get access to more Indian land, and so they revolted. Right. And um, and so this was a battle between the elites. You know, of course, the people on the frontier um, were, um, you know, uh, were invading Indian land. Right. And of course, later, uh, George Washington, during um, 
you know, becomes the town destroyer going through uh, what is the what was the Iroquois Confederacy in New York State and destroying, doing total war, just like Sherman did in, in the Civil War, destroying um, Iroquois villages and and killing men, killing children and 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 women, and um, and devastating them. And so this is, um, you know, this is permission for they're granting themselves permission to behave that way, basically. And uh, but they, um, but yeah, but certainly um, the people on the front, the white people on the frontier were, um, for the most part, very pitiful. Um, you know, they were, they are just. If you read the actual, um, his, you know, uh, um, primary documentation, uh, they were um, living worse than Indians. I mean, they didn't have, so they some of them because you have to realize you're living on the frontier. You don't have access to any of the trading routes. Um, you don't even have ability to buy fabric right uh bolts of cloth you are basically naked i mean really they were quite um pitiful and, and, and they, much more so than the native people who knew how to you know do these things um had their own ways of you know getting access to things and stuff and trade routes and using um things and in, in the lands but it's um and you a lot of the um the uh commentators mentioned this in their diaries and stuff and that these people were quite badly off uh and um, but the um, but yeah, but but that wasn't the concern of the colon of the of the of the uh, the colonial leadership, and you see that in the whiskey rebellion uh, after the after the Revolutionary War, where they are taxing um, the common people, and they are um, and the and the common people rise up because their their the 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 money the currency is worthless, right? Taxation is through the roof to pay for the war. And uh, they no longer have England or Britain to pay for their wars for them, and um, and so they uh, uh, they they rebel. And George Washington puts that whiskey rebellion down quite brutally with force. So the other thing I wanted to follow up with you about was this: is is the is the notion that indigenous people here still see the United States as a, a settle as a colonial state, um, and I and I think we see a, a great example of this with what is happening with the Black Hills. This is where people would recognize Mount Rushmore as being, as, as a perfect example of, of what you're talking about. Yeah, the issue with the, um, so the Black Hills in particular, of course, uh, is, is under the Fort Laramie Treaty, um, for one of them, is that uh, it is part of the Great Sioux Nation, right? It was, it's illegally occupied, um, obviously. And one of the things I point out is that Standing Rock demonstrates that um, that the occupation is held militarily, right? Uh, most mo most American citizens don't really comprehend that that their their occupation is a military occupation and is maintained through military force, and is also maintained through um, kind of bogus law as well. Uh, the I go into details about the doctrine of discovery, right? And uh, um, some of your listeners may be um, very familiar with this, but uh, in brief, the doctrine of discovery uh, was is a doctrine that states that only discovering Christian nations have title to their discovered land, right? That once they, they land there and they put their flag down and read their little thing about their king or queen, then the, 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 the fee simple title of that land reverts to the discoverer, right? The discovering nation. And that the only uh, title that indigenous people have is that of animals, which is uh, um, of um, of use and um, um, and occupy. I just you know uh, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, it's it's not actual title, right? And uh, and we're basically the only people in the world that are subjected to this kind of law. I mean, I think there's the other colonial states like. Um, you know, uh, Australia, that and Canada, those I think the only three countries that invoke this, maybe New Zealand, invoke that kind of that law. And uh, and the way it came about was that uh, in the early uh, years of the Supreme Court, one of the um, first Chief Justices, John Marshall, he made, um, he had three cases that came before his court in the late 1820s to the 1830s. And these cases are called the Marshall Trilogy, and they are the basis for Indian federal law in this country. And, uh, and in one of the cases, um, he had to decide, uh, he had two non-Native men who had title to the same land same piece of land they had. And uh, one of them had gotten his title through the tribe and the other had gotten his title from the state and he determined which title was actually valid. 
Right. And so, uh, and so, you know, it's a new country. There's not a lot of subtle law or, you know, you know, precedents. And so he has to, he's, you know, he draws upon legal, other legal traditions, right? And he turns to the Vatican and he finds these papal bulls, one issued in 1491 and one in 1550, right? And which declare um, that, you know, the Pope declares that, uh, that, you know, this, this, this um, doctrine of discovery, right? Which he calls the doctrine of discovery. And, um, and he decides that, that the U.S., uh, even though the United States didn't exist then, has inherited that status as a discovering country from its its status as a colony of England, which did exist at that time, right? And uh, and so when you look at Rick Santorum saying that we are a Christian country, right? And uh, and people look at the founding fathers and say, oh no, we're not. But you know, actually, that's the legal basis to this day for the claims land is being Christian. Right, being a discovering Christian, you know, uh, nation, and so uh, uh, affirmed and, recently, or at yes, least modern, re semi recently, and by a Supreme Court ruling that was authored by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yes, in two thousand five, uh, the case of the city city of Cheryl, New York, of course, in you know in occupied uh, Iroquois territory versus the Oneida Nation of New York, which is was part of the Iroquois Confederacy. Right. And so in the 1890s, the city of Cheryl, New York, decided, oh, we'll sign a lease, you know, a rental lease with the Oneida Nation and, um, and give them like a dollar a year and do this little ceremony. And as for title for our land, for, for this land that the city is on. And then 100 years later, um, at the end of their little rental agreement, they found um, they found the Oneida Nation was still around, still existed in the 1890s. 1990s and they actually had to renegotiate the lease they thought and they were very it, it's you know it sent, clouded all the title of everyone's houses and businesses there in, in, the, in the city of cheryl and so they took it to the supreme court and they won and um, basically with ruth bader ginsburg writing the decision saying that the oneida nation of york does not possess title because they are an indigenous nation so interesting to think about how we can trace and see the connection between what had happened in Mollier Wildlife Refuge with the Bundys and Standing Rock in North Dakota and, and that connection to those series of decisions known as the Marshall Trilogy, the John Marshall decisions over, over land. Yeah, I think, you know, we need, as Americans, need to understand that their status is as colonists. Right. I think that we are often caught up in the language of American exceptionalism. Even um, progressive politicians are right. They play, they, you know, they play service to the vision of what, you know, in many ways we could be. Do you know what I mean? And uh, but the um, the problem is that there are these real structural problems and uh, and these structural problems um, are very are creating very real uh, divides and, and standoffs in this country. I mean, we saw that when folks, uh, you know, uh, the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6, you know, folks, in, you know, inspired by QAnon rumors and stuff, and, uh, you know, go and storm the Capitol and refuse to believe that Trump was not elected, right? This is very real right now. And so we need to understand um, ourselves. We need to understand how this, what the, what the nature of this country really is in order to um you know uh to change it and and i and find a third way i mean when i give my lecture about how the u.s is still a colony i often ask the audience and i say well you are you know you view yourself as a good person as a moral person you know um but you are a colonist right this is and so you know my question to you is what would ethical colonialism look like and this is really the question of uh, the very existence of every American who is not a citizen of an indigenous nation or who is who I would say, you know, most black Americans do not share this sort of status because of, of, of the history of, um, you know, uh, of, 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 of being held in bondage, in, you know, for the service of this call, you know, to this colony. And, uh, and so, but I mean, it's, um, it is the question of, of being an American. And because you're you're talking about the American dream, which is based on, you know, the um, the division of the spoils of Indian land, and Indian lives too. I mean, to this day, uh, Native Americans have the highest rates of suicide, murder, rape, 
you know, everything, you, you know, bar none, you know, and, and this is the price of the American dream is being paid by our children you know, with their very lives. And so if you are an ethical person, this is unacceptable, right? And you must do something about it. And what I suggest to do is to sit down and really, we need to sit down at the table and renegotiate this relationship. You know, our lands are quote unquote held in trust because the federal government has the title. We do not have title, right? That needs to stop. You know, title we needs to be recognized. We need to have our own nation, right? And, uh, and, and the, you know, because the power structures that are set up are not set up to, to, uh, to, to share. I mean, and I think that, um, you know, it, it's very hard to uh, take a white supremacist system and, and make it equitable. I think we, we are seeing that how challenging that is. Right. And uh, so but what indigenous people have been asking for, you know, even in the civil rights movement was have, have been demanding is sovereignty, you know, not necessarily civil rights in your system, but our own sovereignty. Right. And so the recognition of that sovereignty and, and that put into a formal structure. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful that we have Deb Holland, a, a native woman who is now, um, you know, secretary of the interior overseeing these lands. Right. But she may, you know, she won't always be there. And also, you know, I don't think that's enough. You know, the, it needs to be fixed structurally, not with individuals. And so, but, you know, individuals can make, make that happen. And I believe that, you know, part of the dream and the vision and the prayers that were at Standing Rock are manifesting themselves in this new leadership, you know, like AOC, as I mentioned, and Deb Holland, who were inspired to, to run for office, you know, based on this, based on what happened at Standing Rock. Stand, and, yeah. and so we can sit down at the table and renegotiate this relationship. Standing Rock was, was a very historic moment. Yeah. Did you realize it at the time? Yes, I did. I mean, I never thought to see something like that in my own time. I mean, I know that my parents' generation, you know, of course had, you know, Alcatraz and, and Wounded Knee and everything. And, you know, I think that we often look at like the baby boomer generation and they got to do everything and us later generations don't. But that was really an amazing moment. And, it felt like we and all I, felt like we all missed history until like the last 10 years. Then, God, uh, yeah. I mean, then, uh, you know, I tried to, in my book, you know, honor uh, the young people on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation who started this movement to name them, to describe what they did. Often they are not named or recognized and enough uh, in re recalling what happened. Uh, you know, young parents who really started the uh, meetings, uh, not even in the North Dakota, North Dakota side of the reservation, but down in the South Dakota side in McLaughlin, you know, I... I worked really hard to recount how they did it. You know, uh, a lot of other people came in later and stood in front of them, but I wanted to make sure that people remember that this was something done by the people on the reservation. You know, and um, and that they inspired their 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 government, their tribe tribal government to follow go to follow them. You know, uh, and and not, to, not to done overnight. Up. Yeah, not not done yeah. overnight. Yeah, I mean, it's um, you know, most people don't know their names. You know. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to, you know, give re recognition to that. But the paradigm in my book is built to, um, one thing is I do start it with three oral stories that were handed down in my own family, right, that were told to me as a child growing up. Because I wanted to make people, give um, people a chance to understand sort of what I was bringing to this as a, as a, as a member of a Dakota family, right? And, uh, and I also, um, you know, this book, I stand off, I see as um, part of a trilogy of books written in my family. Uh, one was by, uh, in 1944, uh, speaking of Indians, written by my great, great aunt Ella Deloria, my grandmother's aunt. And then, uh, and then in 1969, uh, Custer Died for Your Sins, written, written by my grandmother's cousin, Vine Deloria. And then this book, in the sense that this is one family's take, on the political situation of their times. Um, for my great aunt Ella, she was um, writing in, in, in the wake of the, um, the, uh, um, the Indian Reorganization Act, right? 
uh, the Yankton Sioux Tribe and the Navajo Nation did not are not IRA governments. They didn't agree to this change, um, but um, mo many of the tribes did across the country, and it, it fundamentally changed the nature of tribal government. And um, but it, uh, I think uh, she's she's writing about this, these changes that are happening at that time, and also her own work as an ethnologist and linguist, interviewing uh, traditional Dakota and Lakota people. And um, she started working with Franz Boas at Columbia University. Um, she graduated from Columbia Teachers College in 1915, and so she began working with him, uh, you know, in New York City, uh, translating um, some of the stuff that was um, gathered in Lakota and. Um, and so she was fluent in all three dialects of our language. And so she did that until she died in 1971. And so her work is fundamental for us to having that bridge back to our elders who lived before the Americans came, because that's who she was interviewing. And then, and then the work of her nephew um, was really, um, you know, Custer died for your sins is also um, it's an, an Indian manifesto, and it was happening during the period of, um, you know of the Red Power movement, and helped to inform and to give um, a sort of a, a critical um, philosophical thought to our, our our goals as Indian people, and um, and then for me to write this now is 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 a continuation of that process in my family of grappling with how how we understand ourselves you know, as Dakota and Lakota people, and then how we, um, how we engage with our present political reality and, and, and that very powerful reality that is forced upon us by the, by the American colonial um, presence in our lives. We, we are almost out of time, but I do want to ask you about one of those stories that you tell, a Dakota story of a monster by the name of Aya. Fun. Oh yeah, well that's not a, a, one of the oral stories, but it's it, I talk about the Ia, which yeah. is a, a monster in Dakota culture. Uh, we have these stories called ahunkakas, which are told at night, right before the children go to sleep, so that they can kind of dream about them. And um, they're sort of um, fables um, and that have moral lessons. And the Ia is a monster that lives by consuming, right? Much like. A colony does and it consumes entire nations of people and you can see when it's sleeping you can see the campfires burning at night of the people inside that it's gotten it's eaten and consumed and so some one of the hunkakas is about um a young hero going uh and and killing the monster um you know and and freeing the people right and so i often sort of see colonialism as that monster and uh so um but yeah it's um you know, I think that bringing the, um, because we often as, you know, people who are educated um, in Western civil Western society, we share a joint Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman sort of, um, um, sort of touch cultural touchstones, right? And, um, but we don't know a lot about um, Dakota and Lakota culture. I mean, and so what I'm trying to bring is that perspective and those stories and that context. And, um, and so that's why I open with three oral stories told in my family. I think one of which has never been published before. Um, maybe two of them haven't been published before, but um, so it's, um, it's to kind of give you a perspective that we don't already have. You know, um, and and that uh, and that's what's so great about my great aunt Ella's writing is that that she provides this very very well documented, um, incredible vision of of a very different way to order society, um, um, with a, she calls it the way of life that work camp circle society, which was amazing at Standing Rock was to be we were finally allowed to live again as a people within our traditional camp circle structure. Right. I mean, it wasn't perfect, obviously, and most of our people don't know that structure anymore, and particularly people from other tribes or, you know, non-native people coming in. It was complicated, but um, but it was amazing. I mean, to be in that camp and to be, you know, hear, you know, people singing, hearing, you know, um, just that being together that way, the community just had so much life to it. And it's just part of who we are, you know, and, and being at Stanley Rock, you know, my... Um, my grandmother's grandfather was born just across the river in Mobridge, you know, because our we're Yankton and we our reservation is in southeastern uh, South Dakota now, but um, but you know we ranged all over that area. We weren't just in one little space, and so and we had relatives um, there uh, as well amongst the bands that were uh, farther north. So, um, but it's um, it was really interesting. I mean, to to take part in that, I think it's. Uh, it's a it's a vision you know and and it does 
rewire your brain in a way. Jacqueline Keeler has been our guest. She is the author of the book Standoff, Standing Rock, The Bundy Movement, and the American Story of Sacred Land. Jacqueline Keeler, I, I felt like we could have easily gone another hour. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have more time this time, but I hope you will uh, come back again in the future. But for now, I, I thank you greatly for taking this time to join us today. Thank you for having me.